I'll just keep moving forward. I'm um, pleased uh, to introduce Dr. Krasinski from Duke. He's going to talk to us about complete transposition of the great arteries. So I have two disclosures. One is I don't have any disclosures. And secondly, I, I won't be doing any jump, jumping jacks because I'm actually less coordinated than Ari is. So. Whoa, as you can tell. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a clinical case. And I think this will warm us up a little bit. So this is Mr. K, who's a 31-year-old gentleman with detransposition that I saw when I was back up at the Cleveland Clinic. He had had a mustard at four months of age at the University of Kentucky, oh, I'm sorry, University of Michigan. He was followed by a pediatric cardiologist, and then he was lost to follow-up after college. And during college, he had a lot of fun. So basically, he used pretty much every substance and went over it. It sounded like something out of Hunter Thompson or something in terms of what he uh, had gone through, lots of recreational drugs. And this is actually a true story. He said he went camping, and he did that to try to detoxify himself. And he went over this whole protocol. It was quite, uh, quite detailed, actually. But unfortunately, while he was doing this uh, protocol detoxification, developed hematemesis, hematemesis and ended up in the emergency room, uh, where he was found to have uh, basically a, a number of esophageal varices that got, ended up getting banded. And they thought his liver disease was related to hepatitis C, which they also diagnosed him with at that time. And then he was referred to the adult congenital clinic, where I saw him for the first time, for assessment of heart failure. So this is his uh, parasternal long axis images. Let's see which one is the pointer here. So you can see the great vessels here are in parallel. And I always tell the fellows one of the critical things when we're looking for transposition is, you know, you should always normally see spaghetti and meatballs, one vessel in longitudinal and the other one in cross section. If you see both vessels as two spaghettis or two meatballs, then you know you've got transposition. So this is a patient with transposition. Here is his short axis view here. You can see the right ventricle that has both volume and pressure overload, which you would expect since that's a systemic right ventricle. And then here's his apical view. Again, this is the systemic right ventricle here. You can see the large moderator band. It's a big ventricle. It's hypocontractile. So he, he, this echocardiogram showed a mildly dilated, moderately hypokinetic uh, systemic ventricle. He had trivial systemic AV valve regurgitation. Uh, an MRI actually confirmed that he had that as well. They also commented on the fact there was a dilated IVC. Um, and the baffles were, actually, this was exactly a quote from the MRI, were intact. Uh, but there was mild IVC stenosis. Well, we were a little concerned. And so we took him to the cath lab. So here's an injection into the SVC baffle. You can see blood going through uh, over into the, uh, the subpulmonic ventricle and out into the pulmonary tract. And then this is an injection of his IVC baffle. And you can see this is his IVC. That's the baffle right there. And you can see how tight the stenosis is going across the baffle. We actually saw a six millimeter gradient as well. So we went in and crossed this. And you can see we ballooned it first. And we placed a stent. And you can see how the baffle flow improved significantly afterwards. So unfortunately, this uh, story isn't ended yet. So he came back about a month later, said he felt tremendously better. He hadn't gone back to his drug habit or anything, but he had said he felt really, really good. And so good, in fact, he didn't come back for another three years, which is a talk in and of itself. And then I saw him three, months, uh, three years later. He, uh, about four months prior to presenting back, he had de started developing symptoms. And it was progressive fatigue, palpitations, intermittent chest pain. We saw him actually, his physical exam was fairly unchanged. He had lost about 12 pounds in weight. Unfortunately, he saw his hepatologist at that point as well and had an abdominal CT that showed a new liver mass. And he is, you can see his NT pro BMP was a little bit higher. His echo was essentially unchanged, but unfortunately got a liver biopsy and was diagnosed with hepatocellular carcinoma. So kind of a sad story. He ended up getting that treated and was doing fine when I left Cleveland. But nonetheless, he illustrates a lot of things about transposition. So this is transposition of the great arteries. So I'm going to mention the uh, concept of concordance. So here you have atrial ventricular concordance. So the RA and the RV and the LA and the LV are in sequence here. But you have ventricular arterial discordance, where the RV is going to the aorta, the LV is going up to the PA. I'm not going to talk very much about the embryology or the different variations in the anatomy, other than to say this is another one of those conotruncal abnormalities. And if you think about it, it's that little rotation that occurs when you're separating that doesn't happen in these patients. And that's why you end up with the vessels being parallel right by 
one another so there's no crossing of the vessels. So what I'm going to try to do is over the next 10 or so minutes, again, another disclosure is I probably won't catch us up because I tend not to be very fast here. But uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the demographics. I'm going to talk really focus in on the surgeries because I think that's most important as, as those of us who see adults with congenital heart disease, we want to know what things are we looking for, what are the consequences of the procedures they had done before. So as far as the demographics, is about 5 to 7 percent of congenital heart disease. Uh, it, male to female ratio here is about 4 to 1. There's a lot of associated lesions. Usually those associated lesions are VSD and also LV outflow tract obstruction, and 5% of those patients can have coarctation of the aorta. The natural unrepaired history is pretty poor. Uh, you have to pretty much have either an ASD or a VSD. As I showed you those circulations, you, can, you, you have to get venous blood from your systemic veins out to your lungs, right, to be able to survive, and blood from your lungs back and out to your body. And unfortunately, that circulation provides two parallel circuits, so you have to find a way to mix the blood. Now, there are patients with transposition and a VSD and pulmonic stenosis that can survive to adulthood because they have a balance in circulation. So there's just enough blood to get to the lungs that it can get oxygenated and just enough getting out so, so there's not excessive pulmonary blood flow either because otherwise you develop pulmonary hypertension and their complications. So there's a wonderful article about what's happened surgically over history that was written by Craig Broberg, just published actually in, in the last few weeks. So the first arterial switch was back in 1952 by Mustard. Um, unfortunately, that patient died during that particular procedure. It was attempted several times, but not successfully at that point. And then the first atrial switch was done by Senning in 1957. Unfortunately, because the outcomes were so poor with arterial switch, we went to the atrial switch procedure. That was done uh, for a period of time. And then Jatine reintroduced the arterial switch back in 1976. And for a long time, there was a higher mortality. And this is really a tribute to the cardiothoracic surgeons who were willing to take the patients despite that mortality because they knew long term it was probably better physiologically to have that type of a circulation. And there was an analysis, interestingly, back in around 2000 that estimated that if you followed patients out to about 28 years, that's where the mortality curve shifted. And then suddenly after that, you would show that there'd be better survival. So there was really the, the persistence of the surges was tremendous. These are actually some curves looking at what happened. So here are the 60s and 70s. You see mostly mustard procedures. Then in the 80s, they switched to the Senning. There was some evidence that actually the Senning uh, was better in terms of some of the long-term outcomes. And then the arterial switches started here. You can see in the 80s and 90s, and now it's predominantly the, uh, this, the procedure performed. This is finished data. And then again in Finland, they showed here, you can see arterial switches now have really just tremendous survival here up to, uh, up to 20 years, uh, pretty much uh, well over 90%. So here are the surgical pioneers for the atrial switch. The uh, Senning did it in Stockholm back in 1957. He used native tissue as a much more demanding procedure, but better long-term results. And one of the reasons why they went back to doing the Senning uh, at some point in the 70s. Uh, in Toronto in 1963, uh, Mustard uh, introduced his procedure, which used foreign tissue to reconstruct. It's easier, so it superseded the sending procedure for a while until it looked like the outcomes were a little bit worse. So this is essentially the atrial switch. It's to bring the SVC and the IVC and baffle them over so they reach the subpulmonic ventricle, subpulmonic left ventricle. It's a uh, innovative idea. Unfortunately, about a third to a half of patients eventually uh, develop systemic right ventricular dysfunction. And if, if you look at that, by 15 to 18 years, that's a, that's a large number of patients, almost half. Um, you also develop systemic AV valve regurgitation because that tricuspid valve really isn't designed to be in a, under a systemic pressures and circuit. Baffle issues are not uncommon, as I just illustrated to you, and sinus node dysfunction is also common. So if you look here, this is the presence of sinus node dysfunction uh, that occurs over time. So it's roughly about half the people eventually end up needing pacemakers. Uh, junctional rhythm is not uncommon to be seen. And also, chronotropic incompetence is a big deal as well. So even if you have preserved sinus node function, sometimes you can't appropriately increase your heart rate as you're exercising. Again, another indication potentially for pacemaking. Atrial arrhythmias are very common. This is a very elegant paper just published in Circa Arrhythmia Electrophysiology. 
And uh, basically, if you look over here, you'll see the different risk factors. And this is a large group of, of patients with congenital heart disease. Um, systemic right ventricle is a risk factor, and also if there's ventricular dysfunction of the systemic ventricle. So if you have those two characteristics, which I said almost all the mustards or settings are going to have by about 20 years out, you can see you have roughly a 25 percent uh, uh, probability of developing uh, atrial tachyar significant atrial tachyarrhythmia. Ablation can be done in these patients. Uh, sometimes you require baffle puncture, depending on where the site of this is. Um, it may require basically uh, ablating on both sides for that reason for the puncture. And recently they showed that 34 tachyarrhythmias were ablated. Atrial, the acute success was 85%. Recurrence rate was about 30%. And if the patients underwent a second ablation, most of them were cured of their arrhythmia. So baffle obstructions can occur in either the SVC or the IVC baffle uh, pathway. Interestingly, if you, uh, if you have one or the other, your azagous vein will often decompress. So oftentimes patients will have very little in the way of symptoms because the azagous will shift that blood away. Um, again, the in, most common indications for intervention are either symptoms or oftentimes these patients need pacemakers. You need a way to be able to tunnel the, the wire across the uh, baffles. So putting a stent across can make a difference. The pulmonary venous pathway can also have obstructions this requires. These are a little more complicated, and you worry about stents there because you can obstruct the other pathway, and surgery often in these patients is necessary. Um, baffle leaks can also occur, um, um, and they basically occur. They act just like atroseptal defects. Um, defect closure or, or covered stent can be placed to, uh, to cover up the, uh, the lesion. Pulmonary hypertension can occur in these patients as well. Um, these usually occur in patients that were repaired later. Um, it's more common if a shunt was present before the repair. Uh, you really need to exclude pulmonary venous. I've seen a couple of patients with pulmonary venous stenosis that were first diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension, and then once we looked, we, we made that diagnosis. But unfortunately, when this occurs, it's associated with a high mortality. I've taken care of three of these patients. One got a heart-lung transplant. The other two, unfortunately, died waiting on a transplant. So it's very bad when this occurs. Um, of course, the big, uh, you know, the 800-pound the, the gorilla in the room, of course, is, is heart failure in these patients that have atrial switches. And it is, in fact, um, other than single ventricle, the most common lesion that we see heart failure uh, uh, dysfunction in these patients. Um, there is a randomized clinical trial looking at uh, the use of the angiotensin receptor blocker, uh, valsartan versus placebo in these patients. Um, interesting and intriguing design. In fact, they did not show any significant improvement in RV function, exercise capacity, quality of life, or clinical events, but they did show that the systemic ventricles did not increase in size or, or decrease uh, or change in mass as much uh, uh, with the drug therapy versus with uh, placebo. So, and the drug was well tolerated. So I think we have some evidence that, in fact, treating these patients with afterload reduction makes a difference. Now, this is a complicated slide that I put together on the plane here, so you can see lots of arrows going in different directions. But whenever you have a patient with a transposition that has different types of dysfunction, you want to look for certain things like chronotropic incompetence or heart block. That's a correctable thing with a pacemaker. If they have progressive RV dysfunction, we'll try medical management. That doesn't always work. Um, if they have progressive tricuspid regurgitation, the guidelines say if the ejection fraction is greater uh, than or equal to 40%, that's somebody that potentially can benefit from a replacement. And then if they have supraventricular arrhythmias, that's somebody that potentially can get medications or a pacemaker. Unfortunately, we often find ourselves in this direction, which is VAD or transplantation. Oops, that was the wrong button. Um, so as far as guidelines go, these are the patients that are recommended in terms of, uh, of intervening uh, in detransposition after an atrial switch. Moderate to severe systemic uh, uh, AV valve regurgitation without dysfunction, again, EF of, of 40%. A baffle leak with a left to right shunt greater than 1.5 that potentially can't be amenable to percutaneous closure. Again, most of these people we're going to try to close. SVC or IVC obstruction, again, not amenable to uh, to uh, percutaneous intervention, a pulmonary venous pathway, which is, in fact, more common. Those are the ones we typically will, if there's an obstruction, send to a, a surgical intervention. And then uh, symptomatic severe subpulmonic stenosis can also be considered for surgery. And for, as far as transcatheter interventions go, as I mentioned, 
Uh, baffle uh, leaks or baffle stenosis potentially can be intervened upon. And probably the most important thing is really th this is not anatomy that ought to be approached by a general cardiothoracic surgeon. It really needs to be somebody who's a congenital heart surgeon. But that almost goes without saying for the majority of these lesions. Um, conversion for a while was exciting, and, and people were, were talking about this back in the 80s and 90s. This was the idea that basically you could retrain the, uh, the subpulmonic ventricle to become a systemic ventricle again, right? You're, you know, it's a left ventricle. Why not try to retrain the left ventricle to be a systemic ventricle again? Um, these were actually, there's a series of them reported by Roger Mee. Unfortunately, if you're over the age of 10 years old, this was not very successful. A lot of those patients ended up on the transplant list regardless of this. There was recently a surprisingly good outcome in, in, a, in a cohort of Japanese patients, they looked at nine patients. They actually had three that were over the age of 15, and their actuarial survival at 20 years was 76%. So pretty interesting. I don't know if this necessarily puts this procedure on the map. Again, we're not seeing as many of these patients now because unfortunately they're dying out or they're getting transplanted. Um, another problem here is VT or sudden death. You can see a cohort of 149 patients that was looked at from Toronto. Um, they looked at various uh, clinical characteristics, advanced heart failure class, the presence of widened QRS complex. These are all risk factors. These are people that potentially may benefit from placement of an ICD. Despite the fact we have guidelines for ICDs, we really don't have guidelines um, uh, applicable to our congenital population. We're still often looking back when it looks at, when we're trying to decide on pacemakers, CRT, or we're trying to decide on ICDs, we're looking at the guidelines that are, that are talking about heart failure in general patients. Um, these patients are not so simple. A lot of times the anatomy for device uh, uh, placement is not straightforward. Particularly in detransposition, you know, Wayne is going to talk to you about L transposition, where the coronary sinus is, is appropriately positioned, where in this case, usually it, it's not amenable to placement of a wire. So, in fact, these patients typically need epicardial leads for this. Um, there are some concern of things like embolic events in those patients that have residual shunts, but it is interesting to note that we now have some data on subcutaneous ICDs, and that's really a promising technology. Mechanical assist device is still fairly early in terms of where we are right now, but that is potentially a bridge to transplantation, and there have been a few patients that it's been reported as destination therapy. Also important to mention that at, uh, this makes up a large volume of our transplant population. Just for like a board-related question for the fellows, if you're a, tr a congenital heart patient who needs a transplant, your one-year survival is less than the general population of heart failure, but your 15-year survival, interestingly, is actually better. This comes up on the boards. I had this on my, my congenital boards. So just briefly to mention, we don't have a lot of long-term data on this, is Jatin and his idea of bringing back the arterial switch. The first patient died after three days, but this was considered a big success because before that, everybody had pretty much died uh, within the, you know, the timing of the procedure. Um, in general, again, initially it was a high mortality because of all the coronary issues. Remember, you have to reimplant your coronaries when you do this. But as the operator curve improved, as the techniques improved, the survival now, the, the mortality is only about, is less than 1% for these procedures. It restores the left ventricle as the systemic ventricle. There's excellent short and midterm results. And we're really only starting to see the long-term results now. I'm only going to mention this briefly. These are the issues. You can get pulmonary stenosis is generally seen earlier after repair. You can do percutaneous options here, but there are anatomic limitations because of all the anatomy that's nearby. Neoaortic uh, root dilatation is very common and maybe as high as 50% 10 years out. Um, again, a big issue. At what size aorta do we operate? I'm not sure I can answer that question for you, but it's something that clearly needs to be studied more. Aortic regurgitation is relatively common, but uh, only about 5% will actually have moderate or more regurgitation at 10 years, so most of it is going to be fairly mild. How we manage that, again, is not known. Coronary stenosis, I think, is really the most hot topic, I think, in this area, and that is how do we assess that? What do we do about it? It's really the bane of the arterial switch. Most of these are going to present early. Oops. Can I go back here? Okay. Um, but it's more common, in particular, if there's coronary anomalies. Um, and screening techniques are now being developed. There's a lot of literature now about different types of techniques. Now, in terms of trying to change the arterial switch, this is a uh, nice 3D image that was published by this group uh, looking at 20 years, the so patient's 20 years out 
from a variation of the arterial switch showing how good the flow looks and how normal the flow looks in the two great vessels. So perhaps different anastomotic techniques, things like that may make an impact long term for these patients. I want to mention on my last there are a few slides here the Rostelli procedure. So if you have a detransposition, pulmonic stenosis, um, and a VSD, what you can do here is you can baffle over through the VSD the LV outflow and then do a conduit from the RV to the pulmonary artery. So you get essentially an arterial switch for these patients. The pulmonic valve is oversown. It restores the LV as the systemic ventricle, but these patients require frequent conduit interventions. The nice thing is now, as was mentioned earlier, we now have transcatheter options. So that perhaps is becoming a little bit more appealing. So in summary, basically, there's no perfect surgical solution for these patients. These are folks that still require a fair amount of care. The mustard are sending as heart failure, valve regurgitation, baffle issues, and arrhythmias, as I've mentioned. The Rostelli, we're going to be doing multiple conduit interventions. The arterial switch, coronary issues, aortic regurgitation, and aortic enlargement are, are common problems. And I thank you for your attention.